in this lecture, we are going to um, make some connections between uh, the Koopman operator theory and um, some basic concepts in nonlinear dynamical systems theory that are geometric in spirit. And in, in particular, uh, we're going to talk about systems that um, have potentially mo multiple uh, basis of attraction to different attractors. Here in, in, in this lecture, we are go going to assume that all these attractors are fixed points, but uh, uh, we'll introduce a technique that really extends beyond that type of attractor and enables us to um, characterize the the basin uh, basins of equilibria um, for attractors that are uh, much more much more uh, complex. Um, so we'll start with this situation where we have you know several fixed points and then we have basins um, of initial conditions that converge to uh, such a fixed point um, at time goes to infinity. And we are going to ask the question as to how this uh, can be characterized using spectral objects, in particular eigenfunctions of the Kupma operator. But then the second question we are going to ask is, is uh, okay, how about the stability of that point? Can it also be characterized by uh, by eigenfunctions of the Koopman operator, you see that the, the the answer to both questions is yes. So we're going to start as usual with, with our system. Uh, I labeled it uh, uh, 3.1 here, but it's really x dot is equal to f of x. Um, so x dot is equal to f of x. And x here belongs to some domain D that is a subset of Rn. So this domain over here. And uh, uh, the basin of attraction of, of, of the fixed point at zero, we are assuming there's a fixed point at zero. The basin of attraction is uh, within a compact domain D, which is inside Rn. <clears throat> and so the main object that we're going to be introducing here is Provided we have a continuous function h defined on d, uh, we're going to define its time average as the limit when time goes to infinity of this um, integral, zero to t h of s tau x, s tau is the flow, d tau divided by t. So uh, practically speaking, we are observing h on different points along the trajectory. So we're gonna sample that H that is an observable at, at each of these points. And then, uh, and then we're going to integrate that set of observations. And then we're going to divide by T and then the limit when T goes to infinity, if this limit exists in fact, uh, then we obtain what we call the time average and note that that function, that new function depends on the initial condition. Because if I started in this beta B over here and started observing H on this trajectory, if H has different values in this domain versus that domain, I would get a, a different value H star. So H star is, so H is a function, H star is also a function of initial, of initial conditions. And that, that's the function that we call the time average. And historically, the time average has had a, a big role in the development of ergodic theory, starting with Birkhoff and von Neumann ergodic theorems. And we'll speak a little bit later about uh, that history when we get to uh, measure preserving dynamics, but here, we are clearly looking at a dissipative system uh, where sets of initial conditions converge to a fixed point. And so now uh, we know that if we have a, a, um, a fixed point at zero, that the limit when t goes to infinity of st of x inside the basin of attraction of that fixed point, let's say it's this one, 
at zero um, is zero. So that limit itself is zero. And since h is continuous, then this h star is equal to h of zero. Why is that? Well, intuitively speaking, as the trajectory goes closer and closer to, um, if, if the trajectory goes closer and closer to this fixed point, what it sees is values that are closer and closer to h of zero because h in, in itself is a continuous function and therefore h star of x um, ends up being uh, x of zero. In other words, h star, the time average, is constant on the basin of attraction of zero. So the basin on the constant of attraction of, of the fixed point here. So now, Let's make a connection of this concept uh, with the uh, with, uh, uh, Koopman eigenfunctions. And we're going to generalize it. As, as I said, we're going to be talking about systems with multiple equilibria. Um, and for that, we use the notion of uh, uh, Lebesgue measure on D. And um, what we'd like to achieve is um, a statement that says level sets of time averages of continuous functions identify basins of attraction. And then we are going to show that those level sets are in fact level sets of a Koopman eigenfunction. Um, but the reason why we can only do this up to measure zero is that, you know, Take, take a look at this simple equation, uh, x dot is equal to x minus x cubed. And you see that we have on the real line an equilibrium at zero, we have an equilibrium at one, and we have an equilibrium at minus one. So this is zero, one, and minus one. And so anything starting on the left of zero, but before minus one goes to minus one, Anything starting to the right of zero goes to one. Anything starting at bigger than one, value bigger than one uh, goes to one as well. So we have two stable equilibria. And so the basins of attraction of these two equilibria, of course, exclude the point zero. That's an unstable uh, fixed point. And that's a measure zero set. So we'll, we'll have to exclude um, uh, measure zero sets in uh, from from the statement uh, that we are going to be uh, that, that we are going to be making, but we are going to ask that our system satisfies that that the, the basis of attraction of equilibria equal the measure of the full of the full space. So here is here is a, a, a little result that we can prove. Uh, so our system x dot is equal to f of x we're going to assume has a finite number n of stable equilibria and their basis of attractions are these beta j's or calligraphic bj's uh, such that the measure of the union of these basins is the measure of the whole set. So clearly we're not requesting that the basis of equilibria, basis of attraction <clears throat> cover the whole set, but, uh, but the, 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 the total measure uh, and for example, in the plane, um, the area of these basins of attraction would cover cover the whole set. Of course, the boundaries of basins of attraction can be fractal objects, so there is no guarantee that that measure zero set uh, would be would be simple. But still, um, uh, it, 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 in 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 the context of measure theoretic considerations, it's small. So. Um, <clears throat> The time average h star of a continuous function h uh, that is defined on our domain d is a piecewise constant eigenfunction of ut, so of the Koopman operator family, at eigenvalue zero defined almost everywhere with respect to the measure mu. So this is a nice connection between, um, between uh, what, what we can call multi-stable system geometry, in particular, the geometry of the basins of attraction 
and um, eigenfunctions of the Koopman operator at eigenvalue zero, because it says that if you find these time averages, they are the eigenfunctions of the Koopman operator and they are constant um, on, on uh, the, the basis of attraction itself. So pick any point X in one of these, um, one of these uh, basins, the J of, of the J equilibrium, and then act with the Koopman operator on H star, which is the time average of function H. So that's equal to UT, the, the operator acting on this expression here, but UT is linear. And so we can actually pass it through the limit. And how do we pass it? Well, if it's inside here, then UT acts on H composed with S tau, but action of UT on H is composition with ST. So whatever X we had here, we need to replace it by STX. And then S tau of STX by group properties, S of tau plus T, S here is the flow of the system. And we're still integrating with respect to tau here and integrating from zero to T bar as dividing by T bar as T bar goes to infinity, that's the limit. And now we replace tau plus T with this, uh, uh, with this new variable V. And we need to change the, the limits of integration. So when tau is, is zero, V is T, when tau is T bar, then uh, V is T bar plus T. We're still dividing by, 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 by T bar, okay? So now we have this integral from T to T bar plus T. We can represent this by um, integral from zero to T bar, but now we added the portion between zero and T, so we'll need to subtract the portion out. And then we, uh, we subtracted the portion from, from T bar to T bar plus T. So we're gonna need to add this back. Now this integral here is a finite time integral. T is finite between T bar and T bar plus T. H is continuous. Um, and so both this integral and that integral end up being finite. We divide by T bar. As T bar goes to infinity, this goes to zero and that goes to zero. And this limit here looks pretty much like this limit, except that I have replaced the variable tau with V. So that's precisely equal to H star of X. And so I got the expression that UT H star of X is H star of X it just means that h star of x is an eigenvalue of eigenfunction of the Koopman operator ut at eigenvalue zero, because remember, in order for it to be an eigenfunction, uh, this would need to satisfy ut, ut phi, is equal to e to the lambda t phi. And if you just set lambda is equal to zero, then the equation reduces to ut phi is phi. So ut h star is h star, precisely proves that um, h star, the time average that we talked about is, uh, <clears throat> is uh, the um, Koopman eigenfunction and eigenvalue, eigenvalue zero. And so now we can repeat this calculation for different, so on the single basin of interaction for any X, this H star is going to be a constant because it's going to be precisely the value of, of H 
at zero at, at the equilibrium. But if we change the Bayesian attraction, uh, and let's say that H has a different value on you know, X2, which is the equilibrium two versus X1, then H star itself is going to be different for these two equilibria. And we are going to get a piecewise constant function on different basins of attraction, um, uh, different basis of attraction. And so therefore this function, the time average as a, as, as a, uh, is a piecewise constant eigenfunction of ut at eigenvalue zero. So the only places where where uh, it it might be different are the the, the boundaries of the base uh, of the of the basins of attraction, uh, and that's uh, assumed to be a measure a measure zero set. Now, of course, we could have taken just a simple limit when time goes to infinity. You know, uh, this simple limit would converge to the value of h at the equilibria. Uh, that that is true. So in principle, for this particular statement, we didn't need to take the time averages. But as we go and develop the theory for more general attractors, that would not quite work. So this limit would not quite work because consider a simple limit cycle. Uh, this limit when t goes to infinity of h observed along a trajectory. So we are going along a trajectory and observing some value, you know, some function h, that would end up oscillating as the trajectory wraps around this limit cycle. It would end up oscillating and therefore the limit would actually not exist. In contrast, the, the limit that I have uh, that I have utilized in this theorem, so that's the, the time average itself that actually exists for these more general attractors, as I'm, I'm going to um, prove um, uh, a little bit later. And so now we see that the systems with multiple stable equilibria can be characterized in terms of level sets of particular Koopman eigenfunctions, namely the Koopman eigenfunctions at at, at zero. In, in, in particular, the, the, the time, the, the, the Koopman eigenfunctions themselves can be computed as time averages over trajectories. And this is quite an important point. And it's, uh, it's an indicator that <clears throat> of two things. One is um, we don't really need to know the operator itself in order to find its eigenfunction. This might sound counterintuitive, but it's true and very useful. Namely, we didn't know, didn't need to know the operator itself to form this integral, right? So the procedure numerically would be start from some initial condition X and follow a trajectory. As you follow the trajectory, uh, observe h at every point of the trajectory and sum along to obtain this integral here, and then just divide by time. There is no explicit mention of the operator in this formula, and yet we proved that the resulting object, h star, is an eigenfunction. Koopman operator is special in that sense that um, that it gives you ability to obtain its spectral properties uh, by using sums like this, or as, as we will see later, weighted sums along trajectories. So it's, 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 it's um, quite unique um, that way. And this also indicates that the whole approach is very much data driven in the sense that uh, H could be an arbitrary observable on the system, something that I can measure, a pressure in a, in a combustion chamber at, you know, measured at some point. Uh, and, and that observation could lead to some conclusions about the spectral 
uh, properties of, of the underlying operator. And that's a, quite an interesting and, and useful property of this, of this class of operators. Now, um, one thing that was proven in the theorem is that the H star, the time average that, as I said, can be computed directly from data is, um, is piecewise, um, piecewise constant. Uh, but we didn't say that that constant is necessarily different for two different equilibria, but of course, uh, that's easy to, to rectify. Let's say we have two different equilibria with their own different zones of stability. Uh, so uh, the only thing that we need to require uh, for these two different equilibria, um, for their basis of attraction to be separated by a, by a function h, is that h1 over here for the first fixed point is not equal to h2. So h1 is the value that h achieves at this fixed point, and that should be different of h2. The time average of all uh, starting from any initial condition in the basin of attraction of this fixed point ends up being H1. The time average of all the initial conditions starting this basin of attraction ends up being uh, this uh, H2. And if H1 is different than H2, then just basically putting uh, you know, a, a blue color or, or some shade on this side and a different one on this side we have characterized the basis of attraction based on H1 and H2 being associated with blue and let's say and let's say red. And that is useful to find numerically um, uh, basis of attraction in a forward manner. Like uh, uh, one finds uh, basis of attraction by integrating along trajectories um, the time average. Okay, so now we have characterized the, the uh, multi-stability or, or rather um, domains in systems that are multi-stable, so different domains that converge to different attractors that are in this case equilibria. Now we're going to discuss how the stability of an equilibrium itself can be characterized by by Koopman, Koopman eigenfunctions. Another uh, very important topic in um, dynamical systems theory, uh, the stability of, of, of attractors. Um, so th this concept of stability is a particularly important concept that has been classically viewed in uh, very differently in linear and nonlinear systems. In particular, for in linear systems theory, it's enough to take the matrix A of a linear system, it's enough to find its eigenvalues. And if all eigenvalues have negative real part, then the system is asymptotically stable. Once we turn to nonlinear systems, even in the simple case with, um, with uh, let's say a single equilibrium, um, it, its stability is proven by uh, what we call the Lyapunov method. So we find a function uh, that is positive everywhere except at a fixed point and whose derivative along trajectories is, uh, is less than zero. And then we also get asymptotic stability. But note that these two points of view on stability are, um, are quite different. So when we switch from linear to nonlinear uh, domain, um, the, the point of view changes. And so even, but even the description of, 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 of stability itself for linear systems already contains a germ of an idea, which is how one could actually generate spectral stability theory for nonlinear systems. So the nonlinear system stability theory, the dominant, dominant technique is, is uh, building a Lyapunov function. That is, that is not spectral. Um, in linear systems, you find a spectrum of, 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 a, of, of the matrix. But we, we already showed in previous lectures 
that the eigenvalues of that matrix A in the linear system are also the eigenvalues of the associated Kuchman operator. So it is natural to ask, uh, wouldn't it be enough to show that we have certain eigenvalues and of, of the Kuchman operator that have negative real parts and associate eigen, eigenfunctions with certain properties and build a stability theory based on that. So that's what I'm going to discuss uh, next. So um, to start with, uh, we observe that zero level set of an eigenfunction of the Koopman operator associated with x dot is equal to f of x is an, is an invariant set. Namely, eigenfunctions satisfy phi dot is lambda phi. So if phi of zero is equal to zero, then phi dot is equal to zero. And therefore, for any time t, phi of t is equal to zero. So if we start on the zero level set, we stay on the zero level set. Also, if phi is an eigenfunction with the eigenvalue lambda not equal to zero, then its value at equilibrium of uh, f is zero. So lambda being different than zero, assume that what I just said is not, is not true. So the value of the, of the equilibrium is not zero. Well, let's go back to the basic equation that an eigenfunction needs to satisfy that's phi dot is equal to lambda phi. And we get phi dot at zero is lambda phi of zero. So we assume that phi of zero is not zero, but lambda by assumption is not zero. And so therefore the whole right hand side is not zero. That doesn't make any sense because phi dot, the zero is an equilibrium, phi dot at zero must be zero. So we get a contradiction. And therefore, if phi is an eigenfunction of the Koopman operator with eigenvalue not equal to zero, then its value at the equilibrium um, of f is zero. So eigenfunctions with non-zero eigenvalues um, have value zero at equilibrium. Okay, so here is the stability theorem. For nonlinear systems that doesn't use Lyapunov, Lyapunov theory. So we start with a set D, a subset of Rn, and we are going to ask that it be connected, forward invariant, compact. And um, we assume x dot is equal to f of x is a vector field on D. So we further assume that f is twice differentiable. It admits a fixed point zero uh, at, at, at our domain D. And the Jacobian matrix A, which is the differential of f exactly at zero, uh, has n eigenvalues with strictly negative real part associated with independent eigenvectors. So we're assuming uh, we are assuming algebraic and geometric multiplicity are, 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 are the same. And we have n eigenvalues with strictly negative uh, real part. This can be generalized. The, the, the conditions can be weakened and, and so on. But, but, but these assumptions give you the gist of the, of the, of the requirements, <clears throat> of the typical requirements. So the statement is then the fixed point zero is globally stable in D if and only if the associated Koopman operator has n eigenfunctions that are once differentiable at least with the real part of lambda i, so of the, of the associated eigenvalues less than zero and they, their derivative doesn't vanish at zero, right? Uh, in addition, these eigenvalues are actually the eigenvalues of the linearization matrix. So as I pointed out before, that's the, the connective tissue uh, between this nonlinear theorem and the linear theorem that we had before is this observation that in, in linear systems, the eigenvalues of the linear part are also the eigenvalues of the, of the operator. But here we are actually showing uh, that that statement is useful. That kind of a statement is useful in the nonlinear case as well. In particular, the eigenvalues of the linearization now are the eigenvalues of the associated Koopman operator for the nonlinear system, right? 
that's stating something something more and more profound about uh, about the relationship between the Kuban operator and the linearization at an equilibrium at a singularity. It's a bigger theme here. It comes out for the for the for the first time that this limit when time goes to infinity, uh, or 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 you know the object, the attractor that we are going towards determines some of the spectral properties of the of the Kuban operator itself. Okay. So we're going to go through the proof. Uh, this is the first bigger proof in, in these lectures. And so first we're going to consider the sufficiency. So uh, um, we are going to start by expanding the eigenfunctions into Taylor series. They are requested to be once differentiable. So we have the phi i at zero. Remember that's, that's going to be zero by assumptions, the value of the eigenfunction is zero at the equilibrium, plus d phi i at zero. If you remember from some previous considerations, d phi i is actually going to be precisely the left eigenvector of the, of the, of the linearization. So we'll come to that in a second, times x, plus some small order in the norm of x. So what that means is that when x goes to zero, this term divided by the norm of x goes to zero. So for example, if we had a twice differentiable function, the Taylor theorem would tell you, would tell you that, uh, that this is of order x squared. But we are allowing here order of x to 1.3 because we are only assuming one, um, one uh, derivative, right? So since phi i of zero is zero, that turns out to be this expression here. And we are also going to expand f of x into Taylor series. And that's going to give us df of zero because f of zero is zero. f zero is an equilibrium. So f of zero is zero. We have df of zero x plus v of x. And that's going to give us an, uh, a notation that we introduced ax. So a is just df of zero plus some small um, remainder in the norm of x. <clears throat> and we know that the eigenfunction phi i satisfies phi dot. That's a directional derivative of phi in the direction of f. So phi dot is f dot d phi i of x is lambda i phi i. And let's also write x as its magnitude times ex, where ex is the unit vector in the direction of x. And then f dot d phi i is the inner product between a and x, where we expressed x as the norm, which we took out as a scalar, ex, and d phi i at zero. Yeah. So, uh, so now a, uh, we take the, the, the transpose of it, Take it to the other side. Note that d phi i is going to be the eigenvector of that A transpose. Therefore, it's equal to lambda i ex. Lambda i gets taken out of the inner product, and we have d phi i at zero and ex in this inner product. And so if you, if you uh, take into account the fact that this is valid for every ex, then the terms that have to be equal are a transpose d phi i and uh, lambda i d phi i at zero. The terms with ex go out because they are they can be chosen arbitrarily. So and and of course a is non-degenerate. So um, a t d phi i at zero is lambda i d phi i at zero. Okay, so we found the the fact that d phi i at zero is the eigenvector of a t the the transpose of the of the linearization matrix and so therefore uh, since we assume that d phi i is not equal to zero the Kupman eigenvalue lambda i is in fact an eigenvalue of the matrix of the matrix um, a so remember we started with the assumption that phi i 
is an eigenfunction of the Koopman operator uh, associated with the eigenvalue, eigenvalue lambda i. So um, as, as I said, d phi i at zero is in fact equal to the left eigenvector wi of a. Well, just by this relationship here, right? And that we encountered before in linear, in linear systems. Uh, but that also means that the real part of d phi i at zero and the imaginary part, remember d phi i, this vector wi, uh, that can be, that can be a complex vector. So we can split it into its components and they must be parallel to the real part of WI and imaginary part of, of WI. All right. So now what that means in turn, that the zero level sets of the real part of phi I is tangent at zero to a hyperplane whose normal is a real part of WI. Just to sketch that. If you if this is the zero level set of uh, of um, real part of phi i, then it's normal at zero must be precisely a real part of w i or vector w i. Right. All right. So uh, equivalently, the zero level set of imaginary part of phi i is tangent at zero to a hyperplane. So this would be zero to a hyperplane whose normal is imaginary part of w i. And remember, this is true for any phi i. So, so for i going from one to n. So we could have another zero level set and that zero level set has to intersect uh, at zero for sure. So this would be zero level set. So phi i is zero. And this would be phi j is zero. And they surely intersect at zero itself because both eigenfunctions phi i and phi j are zero at zero. And then they're, um, they're uh, the associated uh, eigenvectors. Uh, they're independent by assumption, and they are normal to the associated the associated term. So this is the geometry that that we are that we are discussing here. And uh, uh, so let's now suppose that there is another intersection of these functions, all n of them, somewhere in a neighborhood. V. Let's suppose there is another one. So not only they intersect at zero, but also they intersect somewhere away, away from zero. Yeah. Uh, that actually collides with our assumption that these eigenvectors are um, that these eigenvectors are independent because you can just take so so um, so uh, assume the opposite. And then in, in every neighborhood V, yeah? So you can't find a small neighborhood V of this fixed point such that, such that the eigenfunctions don't intersect. You can't find it. So take a nested sequence of such neighborhoods around zero, closer and closer to zero. And each, each, of, these nest, uh, each of these sets, there must be at least one point such that, there must be at least such one point such that the eigenfunctions, the le zero level sets of eigenfunctions actually intersect. Well, what that means as you go to zero is there is going to be a line, you know, that's going to connect all these points and your eigenvectors would in fact have to be parallel at, um, at zero itself. And that's a contradiction to our assumption that they're not, they're not, they're not parallel. So that's the proof of the fact that the zero level sets of eigenfunctions, that there is a small neighborhood V such that the zero level sets of eigenfunctions in fact, in fact don't, um, don't intersect. Okay, so now we know that the zero level sets of eigenfunctions don't intersect on, on a, in a small neighborhood, but 
what we really want to show is that the zero level sets of these eigenfunctions cannot have another intersection in all of D, the domain on which our vector field, um, on, 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 on which our uh, vector field, um, uh, we are considering our vector field in. A, if, if we prove that, then that's going to finish uh, part of our uh, part of our result, because if th the values of the eigenfunctions are everywhere uh, different from zero, then when time goes to infinity, uh, the, the the values actually do go to zero when time goes to infinity by the assumption that the real part of the eigenvalues is less than zero, and therefore they are going to have to go to that to that uh, to that fixed point, and therefore I'm, we're we're going to get stability. So it's important to prove that we can have another intersection in D. Therefore, the, the values of the eigenfunctions are in fact uh, different, um, uh, different from zero. So I can, you know, I, I can find at least one of them that is not equal to zero at, at, at every point. All right. So suppose there is another intersection. Uh, then this intersection must be part of another invariant set, which is not connected to the fixed point. That's clear because, um, uh, because if it was in the basin of attraction of zero, then, then, uh, then uh, it cannot have all the, all the eigenfunctions vanish. I mean, uh, the eigenfunctions vanishing, that means that other point is a fixed point. So it's somewhere outside. So therefore, if I try again, The basin of attraction, so this is D, and this is our fixed point that we are interested in, and, and we are interested in it, its stability properties. And let's say that there is another point of intersection of zero level sets in D, but that, as I argued, must be outside of the basin of attraction of, of our fixed point. That might you know, be intersecting D, but the important point is that the boundary of the basin of attraction now must intersect D, right? Because this point here is outside of the basin of basin basin uh, of attraction by what we have just what we have just argued. So this delta B or the the boundary of B intersecting D is um, is non-empty, uh, but it's also forward invariant because this is forward invariant, the boundary, and the, and D is by assumption forward invariant, and so it contains the limit sets of its trajectories. And so, if we consider a point x omega somewhere on that intersection, and let's assume that that uh, belongs to the limit set, um, and uh, so, so by definition and continuity of eigenfunctions, we must have phi i of x omega is equal to zero for every i, because omega limit points are defined as limits over time subsequences of trajectories, and, 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 and therefore um, we must go to zero on, on such points. Take a ball of some radius, can be small, epsilon centered at x omega. So this is our x omega. Uh, and that intersects the basin of attraction that I'll complete here. That intersects the basin of attraction. So pick a point there. And then I remember the neighborhood V that we proved the zero level sets don't intersect in. Let's say there is a point here in V. Since this point here is in the basin of attraction, it must go through some points of V in order to get to the equilibrium in forward time. And, 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 and for this point here, there is at least one eigenfunction that doesn't have uh, zero value. That's what we proved. So if that eigenfunction doesn't have zero value, integrate it backwards over time, capital T, 
of time capital T. And we are going to have the value at, uh, at this point, x epsilon that we, uh, at, at, at the inverse of this point, x epsilon that we chose inside, uh, pardon me, the inverse of the point xv that we chose inside this neighborhood is x epsilon. So if the value of the eigenfunction of xv is uh, positive, then it's just going to grow exponentially uh, in, in negative time. And so if you squeeze this particular neighborhood very, very close to x omega, we get bigger and bigger values of, of phi i, that is non-zero on this point over here in backwards time. But phi i itself should be continuous, right? It's not only continuous, it's, it's, it's differentiable. And so this gives us a contradiction because we showed that phi i has value zero at this point, and now we're showing that arbitrarily close to it has a very big value. So it would be discontinuous. That's the, that's the contradiction that we wanted. And therefore we proved that zero level sets cannot have another intersection in the itself. And by that, we proved uh, the, the, sufficiency, the sufficiency part of this result. Let me remind you. The, the result says the fixed point zero is globally stable in D if and only if the associated Koopman operator has n eigenfunctions phi i with the real part of lambda i less than zero and d phi i different than zero. So what we proved is that if we find these n eigenfunctions that have those properties, then zero is going to be um, um, globally, globally stable in D. So that's a, a criterion for global for global stability, let us prove the other way, the other way around. And for that, we are going to use the linearization. So now we need to prove that if the fixed point zero is is globally stable in D, then we can find n eigenfunctions that have these properties. In particular, the real, real part of lambda i is is less than zero. And uh, <clears throat> as the necessity part of the proof, so uh, this. The theorem of global linearization that, that we, that we um, proved before tells us that there is a C1 diffeomorphism y is equal to h of x, such that y dot is equal to a y. So our nonlinear system is conjugate, C1 conjugate to the linear system, and has h of zero is equal to zero. And also the matrix dh at zero satisfies that it's equal to identity. So for the linear system, we have n distinct Koopman eigenfunctions, phi i tilde, which are just inner products, complex inner products between y and the right um, uh, eigenvector of a. Uh, that are associated with the eigenvalues of this linearization matrix a. Um, but then the conjugacy proposition, which is, which is on, on, in the previous lecture, shows that the Koopman operator UTF as n C1 eigenfunctions, the form phi i is a composition of phi i tilde with, with h. So the eigenvalues stay the same when we have a conjugacy, the eigenfunctions change by comp composition, by composition. And, uh, and if, if we take the differential of phi, then we get by chain rule uh, dh at zero t w i, and since dh zero at t is identity, that's equal to wi, and that is not equal to zero by, by assumption. And that concludes that concludes our proof. And so these eigenfunctions here that we obtain here, we call principal eigenfunctions. And the eigenvalues of the linearization are called the principal eigenvalues, right? So, um, those eigenvalues that are and eigenfunctions that are associated with the linearization play a, a, a very substantial role in this um, in, 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 in this whole discussion. And remember that when we consider spectral expansions, that um, products of eigenfunctions 
are also eigenfunctions. But the requirement here in the stability theorem was that d phi i at zero is not is not equal equal to zero, but the d applied on phi i phi phi i phi j is d phi i phi j plus d plus d phi j phi i. Since both phi i and phi j are zero at zero, their gradient is zero at zero as well, and therefore they don't satisfy the the assumptions of this theorem. So it is the principal eigenfunctions that satisfy that 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 are featured in this uh, in this stability theory, and they are the important ones, and they end up generating, um, uh, you know, or, or rather containing the information about um, all the other eigenfunctions as long as the space that we are working uh, within is an algebra. So, uh, so uh, that's an important, an important concept and shows us that in fact here, the stability theory that we obtained from the Koopman operator is finite dimensional. We only need to find n eigenfunctions with the specific properties in order to prove stability, despite the fact that the operator itself is infinite dimensional. The stability theory derived from it is, is um, finite dimension. And that's where we're going to stop for this lecture.